Okay, everybody, so we're going to pick up where we left off last time, and let's take a quick look at where we're at in advanced classes. So when we started this, we once again looked at classes as a collection of properties and methods. And when we thought about how we could diagram it, um, we start with something simple like this, where we just see a picture of a person, but the second we add other classes, we need to think about how they're communicating with one another. So by adding the student class and the teacher class, we see that these three classes are in fact interconnected with one another. Each one contains properties and methods, but how are they communicating with each other? Is this a case where one class is just using another class or through association? Or is it something more advanced like the concept of inheritance? How are these, these classes sharing data with one another? So by modifying the diagram a little bit, we got to something like this. So now we are using some sort of a guide. So if we see a arrowhead that is open-ended, it's the is a or the inheritance relationship. So here from the diagram we can see a student is a person, a teacher is a person. If we see the other arrow, the filled arrowhead or a dotted line, then it's an association. So a teacher is an associate of the student or a teacher has a student. Now, I'm also going to take the diagram and divide those boxes up into sections for the properties and methods. So now we could advance this even further. So now we could look at each property of the person class, each method of the person class, etc. But this leads to more questions, like what data type are these properties? Like what is name? What is age? Do these methods need any inputs, any parameters? Do they return anything? Do they have any outputs? What level of encapsulation is this? Are these private objects? Are they public object methods, etc.? And are we dealing with something like the protected? So if we go further into this type of diagramming, the specifics of a universal modeling language diagram or a UML diagram, there are ways to define all these things, right? They have a system. So they can use the plus sign for things that are public, the minus sign for things that are private, the pound sign for things that are protected. They put the name of the data type and then the type itself. Same with methods. They can put the parameters inside the brackets. They can put the return type. So this level of complexity is not needed when creating simple UML diagrams. But if we were to take the stuff we have so far, this would be a way to visualize the code we have. Okay? And we finished off by creating a second teacher, by calling our clone method, outputting the teacher, checking to see if they're equal using our equals method, then taking the second teacher and adding a student to it, so now they're not equal teachers. Okay. So the next piece that I want to teach you in the classes unit is the concept of an operator called the instance of operator. Now, it uses the word operator because what it does is it determines if an object on the left side of this and the object on the right side of it are in fact the same type of object. So it'll return to you a Boolean true or false. So it's very much like an equal sign, except you're checking to see if one object equals another. So, and in this case, sorry, not equals, but they're the same class type. So what we're going to do is we are now inside our advanced classes test, and we're going to add a method to this class. Okay, it can be a little private, void, check the status method, and we're going to check the status of an object an object called object. Okay. Now we know that all classes derive from the object class. So that's nothing new, but here's where we're going to use this new operator. We're going to say if that object is an instance of a person, then we're going to just do an output saying that this is a person. Okay, but then we're going to take that if statement and then put another if statement to say, is this an instance of a student object? If it is, we'll say that this is a student. And then finally, we'll output it again and ask if it's a teacher. And if it is, we'll output that it's a teacher. So this method, check status, will take a object as a parameter and use this thing called instance of 
to determine which class type it is. Okay, so now let's put this method to the test up here under the code we'd written. Let's check the status of our person. We have a person. You may remember this was something we created way at the beginning of this class. Person, person. Then we have a student. So let's check the status of that student. Okay. The next object we created was a teacher. So let's check the status of that teacher. And after we created the teacher, we created a second teacher called Teacher2. So finally, let's also check the status of Teacher2. Okay, so this should call this method. Let's see what it does. Okay, so here's what we see. The first thing is a person. So that's true. Person is a person. But with the second one, it's saying student is a person and is a student. Because both of those things are true. Student is both a person and a student through the fact that when we created the student class, we said that student extends or is a person. So that works out well. And then the same with teacher. If we look at our outputs, a teacher is a person and a teacher, and teacher too is a person and a teacher. So that's our check status method, which makes use of something called instance of. All right. Now the next thing I want to talk about is some theory behind the concept of memory. Now memory is something we've been talking about all the way back if you took my grade 10 computer science course or even when you first learn about variables you learn about memory. So let's examine what that means. When I first taught you about variables I say okay well here's a line of code int x equals 10 and the way I would draw it so that you could understand what was going on was I would draw it something like this. I'd have an x, I'd have a box, Inside that box would be the number 10. And when you first learn about variables, that's usually enough to understand what's going on. When we got into arrays in the grade 11 computer science course, I would write code like this, int a equals new int with four slots, and I would draw it out something like this. Now, it could have also been drawn up down, but it would be a variable called a, specifically an array, and it would have four slots, slot number 0, 1, 2, and 3. And that was enough to understand what was going on there. Okay? Even when we got into classes, like something like this, create a class that has an integer, a double, and even an array in it, and I would say, okay, when you create an object from that class, so you make a foo object called A, then it would have a X in it, it would have a Y in it, and it would have a Z in it, and it would be filled up with various values. Okay? So, the data structure was now the term that we were using because it implies that this is a structure of all kinds of data. So it's a more accurate way to describe something like a class. Is it's a structure of data rather than just a variable. Okay? Doubles require a little more space than integers. right? Arrays are a collection of boxes. Um, so all of these little boxes helped you visualize what's going on inside of memory. Now that was both at the grade 10 and grade 11 computer science level. And it did help you grasp, hopefully, what was going on inside of memory. Okay? What memory actually looks like is basically just a bunch of little mailboxes, little memory locations. So every little box inside of all your computer's memory holds some piece of data. And each of these, very much like addresses on your house, has a little address associated with it. So that you can find a specific mailbox, just like you can find the mailbox if you were a a mail delivery person, you could deliver it to the correct house, the computer puts addresses on all these boxes so that you can find a specific spot to use for storage. Okay? Some data structures like strings are going to need a few more boxes because they hold more data. Other data structures like booleans need very few little boxes. Each of those, however, needs a reference to the box as well. Okay? And that's what the name of the variable provides. So if we look back on that original idea, int x equals 10, what's really happening is two things. Yes, we have contents with a 10 in it, but we also have the address to it or the identifier to where those contents are stored, and the two things are linked together. 
So your identifier references your contents. Okay? This is now the way I want you to think about memory at the grade 12 level. Okay? It's a better way to think of the memory, that you have the identifier name referencing its contents. This is true for arrays as well. So let's examine this with an array or a class. Okay? So with a class, we have the identifier A, which references other identifiers, X, Y, and Z. X references one piece of content. Y references one piece of content. Z is a reference to three pieces of content. That's why when you access an array, you need to give it a little more information. You need to put the square bracket and identify which index number. That's also why when you reference something with a class, you say something like A dot X, because you're giving more information to get to the right identifier to find the right content. Again, this is very similar to the way like mail works in general. Right? If you just send a, a, a letter to, say, uh, 35, that's not enough information. You need to give the street name. Oh, 35 Smith Crescent. Okay, well, that's good. But now you also need to know the city, possibly the country, so that you can get to the specific identifier of where that piece of content goes. Okay? This is another reason why we want to use the word data structure, because the code represents like a way the memory is managed to find the right addresses. Okay. So the next thing I want to show, and it relates to this idea of memory, is the idea of this keyword called static. Now, you've actually seen that keyword all the way back when you run your first Java program. So if you think about it, let's jump over to the code for a sec. If we find our original Java file, the main class, and within it the main method, that word static has been there since the beginning. So for the most part I've said, oh, you don't need to worry about it, it's just part of the signature line for the method main. And actually when you first learn, I don't even let you worry about really what's going on here in main, because you haven't learned about methods yet. Then once you learn about methods, the word static is just something that you just kind of add to it. Meanwhile, we know what the other words mean. We know that this is the name of the method, this is its return type, this is the encapsulation level, is it public, private, or protected. These are the parameters, we now know this is an array. We know everything else in this line, but the word static still kind of remains a bit of a mystery as to what that actually means. So the way it's defined is static is basically a way to modify a data structure like a variable or a method or two other things that we don't use very often, a named block or a named class. We're not going to use those in our example. But what the word static means is that the thing that static is applying to is being modified so that it is now a shared thing. Okay? A shared data structure or a shared method. In other words, the method or the data structure belongs to the entire class rather than a specific object of the class. So, to summarize that, if you declare something as static, okay, if you declare a data structure static, it then is shared. If you describe a method as static, it's then called a static method and it's shared. Static data structures only get memory once without having to run memory multiple times. Static methods can be called or invoked without the need for even creating an instance of the class. So we'll see we've actually seen these before. Okay? But let's add it to our example. And what I want you to do is I want you to go to the student class. So go to your student class and I want you to add a another property. Right now all we have in the student class is the student number. So what I want you to add is a public static integer called total students. Now, by adding this keyword static in, it means that this variable, total students, will be shared by all the students in the class, like every single object that's a student object. Every single one of them will share that. Okay. So now, let's also add something to our constructor. So with our constructor, let's make the total students go up by one every time we construct a new student. So the second we construct a new student, that number goes up. And we're going to add that in there. And just to make life a little bit easier for us, 
we're going to create another constructor for our student class. Okay? So let's overload this constructor. Start by copying, pasting. So we have a second student constructor. So student number, name. Let's add one with the age, the gender is male, okay? And we already have the student number there. So now when we build a student, we can build it with a student number, name, and age. Previous to that, we just made it with name and student number. The gender and age were not set, okay? So now, we've set the student number, we've increased the total number of students, we've set the name, can we change the age? Well, absolutely we can. We can go into the super class and change the age. Because the super class of student is person, so that works out. Can we set the gender? Okay, well, sure. I can use the word super again. I can also use the word this. Okay. Now, is male is not public with person. It's protected, which does mean, though, that the student has access to it because student is a child of the person class. So I can use the word super or the word this interchangeably here because they both kind of mean the same thing in this context. This refers to the student. Super refers to the person, but because a student is a person, they essentially mean the same thing. So those two words are essentially interchangeable in this case to access the age and the gender. Then I increase the total students. Okay, so let's go back to our testing class. Let's make a couple more students. We have one student already, just called student, but let's make another one. Student, um, so let's make a student called Peter equals a new student. Okay, and according to our parameters, we have to give it a student number. So we'll make this student 101. The student's name will be Peter Parker, okay? And then the age, 16, and yes, is a male, okay? Let's make another student. Student Matt equals a new student. Student number 102, name Matt Murdock, age, oh, 32, oops, and is a male, yes. Okay, and another one, student Katie equals a new student, student number 103, Katie Perry, age, I don't know, 21, is a male? No. False. Okay. All right. So now I have three more students that are created. Okay. Within each student, it has created them, and each student has stored its own student number. And because a student is a person, each student also stores its own name, its own age, and its own gender. However, the total students is a value shared by all the students. So we're going to see that in our test by doing something like this. We're going to output, we'll go to Peter dot total students. Okay? Now, if I do that, you'll notice it doesn't pop up as something I can do, but it will allow that code to happen. So I play that, and there we go, six total students. One, two, three... This is four. The other two students were created when the teachers were created. The teachers added this student, Billy Bob Jr. That was a new student created as well. And then the cloning also created a new student. So if you look at the teacher class, when I clone a teacher, if you remember back, if I look at that clone method, it creates a new teacher, and then it also creates a student by cloning the student, and the student clone method as you recall, creates a new student as well. So it's a very deep clone. So every time you create a new student, in other words, every time you call the constructor, it will increase that variable by one. And that's why it's showing us a six. 
because we had four active students plus when we created a teacher we created one on the fly and then when we created a clone we added that student with the clone so that takes the total up to six this time okay now you'll notice that I can access that variable from either from any student so I can say print print line um, so I can for example go into the teacher brack dots go into the teacher's students at spot zero dots read the total students okay so here you can see I'm going into a student that's stored by the teacher and accessing that variable called total students but the thing is this variable is shared by this one as well so it should also show me a six and it does okay all right so that's one of the benefits of a shared or a static property which is what we made with total students here it's a static property okay so if we take a look at this total students is shared by all of the objects of the class unlike other variables which each have their own little references Peter Matt and Katie all have a reference to the same variable called total students they don't have each one doesn't have their own total students they all share it and that's what something static essentially means now we can also write static methods so let's go to our person class and let's drop a method in at the bottom of the person class okay so it'll be a public method it'll be a static method it'll be void and let's just call it end of the world it's a very basic method when I call this method I will just s out that the world went boom okay now oops let me re put that in properly end of the world okay so now here I've added this keyword into the method which means that this method now is shared by all the people now if you think about that that's actually a pretty big concept so let's put it to the test now okay well I have a person called person so I can say person dot end of the world and it should be able to run that method because it's part of the person class and sure enough the world went boom but if I copy this I can also think that that also applies to student because a student is a person it also gets access to this method so sure enough a student can also end the world but wait a teacher can end the world as well because a teacher is a person so that should work as well and it does but the other neat thing about static methods is you actually don't even need to create an object. I can actually just do this. Person, notice the capital P, that's the class, dot end of the world. And it will run the method right from the class itself. And there it did. Okay? I can also run it from the student class and the teacher class. All of that works because of the fact that it's static or shared so that's one of the powers of static the only thing I would caution you about with static is because it's shared it it makes sure that's what you intended when you coded it otherwise it can create some weird results all right so the next concept I want to go over is the concept of polymorphism now, you've maybe heard that term. It was one of the last concepts I kind of did at the end of the grade 11 course when I was talking about classes, this concept of polymorphism. But I don't think I did a good enough job explaining it. So I want to go into more detail with it here in grade 12. So first, let's examine the word itself. It comes from the Greek poly, which means many or much. And morph, to morph, means to form something or to shape something. Now this is not a term that's exclusive to computer science. In biology, polymorphism refers to the principle where any organism or species can have more than one form or more than one morph. So for example, butterflies and moths, moths morph into butterflies. So a, a, a moth or a butterfly 
um, sorry, I meant a, uh, a caterpillar, um, is a polymorphic organism. Um, in computer science, the common use of polymorphism in object-oriented programming occurs when a parent object is using to reference its child objects. So in other words, the two classes are morphing into each other briefly to execute your code. Okay, so we're going to apply this to our example. So we want you to jump to your code. And what we're going to do here is we're now going to add a few more classes to our advanced classes package that we have. Right now we have three, four classes in there. The test, the person, and the student. So by right-clicking and adding a new class, we're going to add more classes to this. This should use our template, by the way, that we edited in a previous uh, class. So the first class we're going to make is a doctor. Okay? So we're going to make class doctor. By doing this, we now have a doctor, the two string, the equals, and the clone method have all been put into this doctor class. Okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say a doctor is a, or extends, person. A doctor is a person. Okay. Now, we go to our person class. That's all great. We can make a person this way. But one of the things we can do with person is we have to set the name and the age and stuff, all that, after the fact. So what I think I'd like to do is overload the person constructor with a second constructor that takes the name, the age, and the gender as parameters, and then adjust our constructor accordingly. Okay, again as a reminder. But this is not correct code. This will not work because this seems sort of almost like recursion happening here. So we need an explicit reference at the front here by saying this dot name. Okay? That way it's now clear that it's differentiating between the parameter called name and the property called name. Okay? And that again should be a bit of a review. So there's our new person constructor. So now I'm going to use that with my doctor class. Okay? So the doctor also takes the name Okay, the age and oops, the gender as parameters. So when I construct a doctor, I have these, and all I need to do then is set those in the super class. So I can just call super name age is male to set those three properties up. Okay. I now can build a doctor object. So let's go to our test and let's just quickly make a doctor. Doctor, doctor equals new doctor. Okay, the name of this will be uh, Doctor Doom. The age, I don't know, 50, and is a male, yes. Okay, there's our doctor class. Okay, done. Now, we can run that. It's not going to do anything, but that seems to be compiling just fine. All right, next up, let's add another class to this project, another new Java class. This class will be the high school student. Okay, a high school student, capital H, capital S, capital S. Okay. This doesn't extend person, this extends student. So a high school student is a student. Now, we look at our student class. Our student class does not have a default constructor. The only way you can make a student is by giving it a student number and a name, or a student number, name, age, and gender. There are two constructors available, but there is no default one like there was with the person class. So as a result, I can't do this. This method is no longer valid. So here's one of the nice things about using template classes like this. The rest of these methods are fine, okay? Except with this one, I'm going to delete the constructor. So there's no constructor. Now we have a problem. Now it's saying 
no constructor found, but the light bulb allows us to create one of the two constructors. Let's create the second one. And notice what it did. This time it, it not only built the constructor for us, but it also makes the call to the superclass for us. Well, that's handy. It just did all the work that we did in Doctor nicely for us. Perfect. So now we can have a high school student. But if we think about it, if we output a high school student, how are we going to know what's the difference between that and a doctor? So let's add a little bit of code to the toString method, first starting in doctor. So we'll say super.toString, which we'll call the person class toString method, which will say their name, their age, and their gender. But let's add a little bit to that in the doctor class. So let's add, oops. A space is a doctor. Doctors like that. They like to be called doctor. So this thing is a doctor. And then let's go to the high school student and also add to its two string method is a high school student. Okay. So there we have that. So now we have both a doctor and a high school student. Let's add another one. Right class new Java class. This one will be the computer science teacher. A computer science teacher. Okay, so I'm guessing you know where I'm going with this. A computer science teacher is a stu teacher, so extends teacher. Okay, that will break the constructor because the teacher class constructor, as you know, needs at least a name for it to work. So, let's delete this constructor, use the light bulb to have it create a constructor for us. Let's modify the two string method to say is a computer science teacher. And now we have three more classes. Computer science teacher, whoops, high school student and doctor that we can build objects for. So let's go to our test and let's build some new objects here. Let's get this turned down a bit. Okay. So let's start with a doctor. Oh, sorry, we already made a doctor. Let's make a high school student called um, high school student equals a new, I'm going to move down a line, high school student. Student number, uh, 1001, their name, Stu, how about student, their age, 15, and no, not a male, female. Okay, that's a high school student. Now let's make a computer science teacher called computer science teacher equals a new computer science teacher. And all we need to give them is a name. So how about comp teacher? OK, so now I have doctor, high school student, and computer science teacher as objects. Let's output them. Let's output doctor turned into a string. And we'll do that for the high school student and the computer science teacher as well. So we're going to output all three of these as a string. And I'm going to play it. And there we have Dr. Doom and is a doctor. We have student 101 student is a high school student. And we have comp teacher, which is a computer science teacher. All right. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere, and actually, if we were to apply this to our diagram of what we've been creating so far, we're going to see something interesting happening here. Let me just put the, the words out there. So we have a person. We also have a student. We have a teacher. Oops. Now we also have a doctor. We also have a high school student. Make that a little bigger, obviously. 
And we have a computer science teacher. So these are all our objects now that we have. Let me just make these a little bit smaller. Okay. And if we box these, put these inside of boxes to represent that these are all classes, we can now think about the relationship between these things that's a little bit different. Um, whoa, why is that so long? Okay. So each of these things is related in some ways to one another. And again, I'm going to use that UML diagram idea as a basis for this. Okay? Like how are these things interrelated to one another? Let me just make them a little bit bigger so we can see them better. There we go. Okay. So a student is a person. We know that. A doctor is a person. A teacher is a person, so I'm going to put that under there. A high school student is a student, and a computer science teacher is a teacher. So now I can draw the relationship there. So I'm going to set this up to draw. Well, a, as I said, a doctor is a person. So I'm going to draw the arrowhead there. Okay. A student is a person. A teacher is a person. But there's another relationship going on. A teacher has a student. I'm going to fill that in. So that's also a relationship going on there. We've seen that in the previous diagram. But now we can also see that a high school student is a student. And a computer science teacher is a teacher. Now, if I wanted to, I could also draw a dotted line over here to student because a computer science teacher has a student. But because it is a teacher, it's implied in the diagram itself. So there's another way to look at what's going on there. All right. Now we got lots going on here in our classes. Let's add another one, another new Java class, the Mr. Walks class. Okay, I wonder if you can guess where I'm going with this. Mr. Walks is a teacher, but specifically extends the computer science teacher. So is a computer science teacher. So I'm going to delete the constructor and add this constructor. Okay, and I'm going to modify this constructor. I'm going to actually eliminate the need for this parameter. And instead, I'm going to send it the name right away, Mr. Walks. That, we know that. I might as well set a few other things while I'm at it. The age. Well, 47, I know. The gender can be set. Okay? So with that, I'm setting the properties of the computer science teacher through the name, which sets the properties of the teacher through the name, Okay. Oh, but look, it's setting the age here, so it's going to reset it back to 30. I wish I could reset it back to 30. Um, which sets properties of the person, the name, the age, and the is male. So there, when I create a Mr. Walks object, it's going to create all of that for me. Okay, let's put it to the test. Mr. Walks, this is the best code ever. Mr. Walks equals new. Mr. Walks. And I only need a default constructor. You just need to build it like that. So then let's output Mr. Walks dot to string. Before we run that, let's modify the to string method of the Mr. Walks class. Okay. So like we did with computer science teacher in high schools, is uh, is the Mr. Walks. Okay, so let's run that. And there it is. Mr. Walks is 47, is a male, is a computer science teacher, and is the Mr. Walks. There. It's all coming together, all these classes now. 
Now, if we wanted to, we could spend a lot more time writing things like the clone method, the equals method, determining how two Mr. Walks objects are equal, etc. But this is now showing an example of all the different ways we can start building classes and interconnecting them to them. So now again, I can think, oh, okay. So now I have another class on here. This class is the Mr. Walks class, and that class falls here, which means it's related in the sense that this thing is a computer science teacher, which is a teacher, which is a person. Now, we can keep going from here as well. We can build on more here. We could also build on different versions of doctor and things like that as well. Okay? We've got lots of different things we can deal with. So now that we have lots of classes to deal with, person being the parent of all of them, person is the parent of, these are children of the person class, these are children of the person class, but they're also children of student and teacher, etc. We see the classes interconnected to one another. So now I want to use this to work towards this concept of polymorphism by adding another class to our project uh, package. But this is a special class. This is a Java class called the meeting. M-E-E-T-I-N-G, a meeting. Okay, so let's start writing our meeting class. So the thing about the meeting class is we're not going to need all the methods. So you're going to actually delete a lot of them. We don't need clone. We don't need equals. We don't need to string. We do need the constructor. So we're going to simplify this class down to just the constructor. Um, I know it's a good idea, that's why we had it in the template, but I also said that you won't always need those methods, so it's easier to have them and delete them than to not have them and write them. Okay, obviously this is something to do. But let's start with properties of the meeting. So to have a meeting, we need members for our meeting, so like it's a meeting of a, of a sports club or something. So we're going to make a little private person array called the members. These are the members of the meeting. So now we're going to be working with arrays again. And these, this is an array of type person. So every member will be a person in our array. But when working with arrays, we need to know what spot we're at. So we're also going to have a little private integer for counting which spot we're at, or how many members are we currently at. But we also, with arrays, need to have a maximum. So we're also going to have a private final, because it's not going to change integer called the max number of students, or sorry, not students, max number of members of this meeting. Now, this might look familiar to you because we did this exact similar code in the teacher class. Okay? So now, let's get ready for the meeting. Count equals zero. Max members. Let's set it a bit higher. Let's set it to 500 people can attend this meeting. And then the members equals a new person array set to the maximum number of members, which we just set to be 500. So this code builds up what it is to be a meeting. So there. So let's go back to our testing class. Whoa, we got so many classes open now. And let's set up a meeting. Meeting, meeting equals new meeting. Default constructor. Okay, so the meeting is ready to go. It ran the code to build up the meeting. Now, obviously, to use a meeting, we need to write a couple more methods here. So let's write a little public void attend this meeting. And who will be attending it is a person. A person called person will be attending the meeting. Again, this is very similar to our teacher class where we added a student. It's so similar, in fact, that I actually basically need these exact same three lines of code, except now I need to make an adjustment. The, the array is now called members. The max is now called max members. And I'm not adding a student, I'm adding a person. But you can see there, the code is exactly the same to attend a meeting. Okay, let's go back to our test, and let's have some people attend the meeting. Meeting dot attend. We'll have a person attend. Oh, we can also have a student attend. Oh, we can also have a teacher attend. 
We can have a doctor attend. We can have a high school student attend. We can have a computer science teacher attend. We can have a Mr. Walks attend. All of these people can attend because they're all of type person. Now you're thinking, well, no, this one's not a person. It's a Mr. Walks. Yes, but a Mr. Walks is a computer science teacher, and a computer science teacher is a teacher, and a teacher is a person. So it all relates. And that, my friends, is what polymorphism is. By using this parent class, it implies that all of these objects can morph into people if needed to be, because they are people. And that's what we do. All right, let's add one more method to the meeting class and call it a day. Let's write a method to hold the meeting. So public void hold the meeting. So we'll use this method to output a bunch of stuff. So let's start by outputting a little warning. Caution. There are students at this meeting. Okay. And actually, we know how many students there are. There are student dot total students. That gives us the ability to access the shared property that we have there. Okay? So this number, uh, oh, I got that plus sign twice, is being used to read how many total students are at the meeting. Ah, that's handy. That was our static property. Okay? Now we're going to run a for loop and go through all the members members.length. And I'm going to pause here for a second to explain a optional piece of code to learn right here, really quickly. When you do a for loop through an array, like we're doing right here, you'll notice that the new versions of NetBeans actually suggests that we could change this for loop. And this is in the slide notes as well. In the slide notes it explains that we can actually use something called the enhanced for loop. It's an option. We don't have to use the enhanced for loop, but let me just explain a little bit about it. The enhanced for loop not necessary is basically works the same as the regular for loop that you were originally taught, but the enhanced for loop is an option for looping through arrays or more advanced concepts like collections, which is going to be our next unit. Okay? New versions of NetBeans actually suggest that this is what you might want to do. So I thought right here with this example we could try this. They allow you to write a loop without a counter variable by basically doing this and it's another tool that you can use. So I'm going to take the light bulb suggestion and convert to a for dash loop known as the enhanced for loop. The way you can think of this, and I'm going to put a comment under this to essentially help explain it. The way this is read is for every member in members. That's the way you can think of it. That's the way this essentially means. Because members is the array. That's why the S is there. Member will be one individual member of that array and it'll automatically keep cycling to the next one. So it's kind of a neat idea, but it could be a little bit tricky to use. Okay. So we're going to loop through every member and output it. So we'll say member, whoops, so we will output member dot to string. So we'll teach, 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 take every member that we get out of the array and output them as a string. Okay? But we can't do that because the entire array may not be filled up with people. So we've got to check that with an if statement first. So we'll say, well, if member is not a null, because if it's in the array and there's nothing there, the null will be there, then I will output it. So we'll output it as long as it's not a null. Okay, so that'll be cool, and that'll allow us to hold the meeting. But we're going to add one more inner if statement inside of this if statement. We're going to say if this member is an instance of a Mr. Walks object, we're going to output one more thing. We're going to output that shh 
be quiet. Mr. Walks is talking. So we're going to also add that output if the member inside of this array is an instance of a Mr. Walks object. So I just wanted to do that to show you sort of some of the code you've been learning so far and how that works. So finally, we'll go back to our testing class and let's hold this meeting, meeting.hold. All right, let's see the magic play. All right, so caution. There are seven students at this meeting. Jane Doe is zero and Ismail is false. Student 2016, Jeb Bush. Teacher, Mr. Sidious, who also has a student. Dr. Doom. Student 1001, student. Teacher, comp teacher. Teacher, Mr. Walks. Shh, be quiet, Mr. Walks is talking. So all of the polymorphic content starts coming together. And that is where we'll stop for today.